have the most amazing kind of new opportunity in my life, Ruby Nell Sales, who might not need an introduction, but was the youngest member of the student nonviolent coordinating community, committee, um, working with the, with the Southern Freedom Movement, yes. is what we call it, uh, in Lowndes County and all over the South. Uh, is in New York now. Her Spirit House project, which has done amazing work, like hosting salons for women to have deep conversations, um, sponsoring and producing artist concerts that lead to justice, and also hosting what they call Hope Zones, which are places where young people and old people gather to learn and grow and uh, create a revolution, is at Middle Church now, um, developing a new project with us, a brand new project, the Rosemary and Vincent Harding Center for Spiritual and Social Restoration. Yeah. Woo! Woo, you got it right. <laughs> so I'm excited that Ruby gets to be my big sister, mentor, colleague, friend, mama, but also lives here and shares some space with us which puts me in great conversation and connection with her posse and her with ours. So I want to introduce you to Ruby and then we're going to get started. Ruby Nail Sales. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Our talk is about race and the economy. I claim myself as a womanist theologian, which is why I love the color purple so much. But also I understand as a woman of color, a woman of color who grew up with two poor parents who pushed and shoved us out of the nest and into college to raise us up to do more, to be better, to have a better life than they did in their poverty with their single moms, that there is no way to separate gender sexuality, race, and the economy. They're inextricably braided together. So if we're having conversations about the economy, we have to have conversations about race. And if we're having conversations about race, we have to have conversations about gender and inequality and sexual orientation, badgering and craziness. So this is the conversation that Ruby and I are gonna to have today. And I wanted to set a little bit of a theological frame. She's gonna set a theological frame. We're gonna have a great conversation about these hot mess times and save some room for Q&A. Does that sound like what you signed up for? Yes. Okay, so I'm a Christian from the womb. I didn't have a choice about being a Christian. Mom and dad were Christians, I'm a Christian. Um, but my Christianity has changed over time. But the narrative has changed over time. I went as a little girl from Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life being sung in our gospel choir to, of course, there's a lot of ways. Of course, there's truth and light. And who, what kind of stingy God would it be that only spoke one kind of language so that only one kind of people would... I wouldn't work for that stingy God. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Over time, my God has gone from being a white man with a beard to a round, sexy brown woman with big breasts. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what I see. And a big behind. And a big booty. Woo! <laughs> like my mama, right? My God image is deeply connected to my mom, who left us last year in April. April 25, but she was my first preacher. And so as I interjected or took in the God image, um, as I was idealizing her, beautiful personality and soft lips and big breasts and big booty, um, also the first sermon she ever preached to me was at the first time I took Eucharist or the communion. And the bread is coming by and it's this Hawaiian sweet sticky bread the kind we made sandwiches with. And she whispers nothing about dead saviors. She says, this bread means God will always love you. So I eat the sweet, sticky bread, and I think, 
wow, God will always love me. Okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And then the little Welch's great little cups go by. The children love little things. I'm like, look at the cup. I'm six years old. And she whispers in my ear, this cup means God will never leave you. So my first mommy sermon was God will always love you and God will never leave you. So over time, the most important pieces of my faith are the omnipresence of God, the, the ever-present love force. And my eyes are open, my ears are open, my heart's open. I don't care how you call that thing, that ineffable thing. Call it love, call it life, call it the universe, call it the trees, the oceans. Surely, surely God is speaking to us in many languages in all these ways. So my canon is a lot smaller. Thank God for the lectionary. I would preach like three texts all year long. <laughs> One would be Psalm 139, where I'm reminded that I'm awesomely and wonderfully made in the image of God. I could preach that every week. One is Romans 8. Nothing separates us from the love of, the love of God. Not anything in life, not anything in death. And then I would preach Luke 4. The Spirit of God is upon me. And God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, sight to the blind, and liberation to the captives. And the one I would preach other than that every time I could would be Isaiah 58. And I'm just going to read a little of that because, you know, it's just too pretty for me to paraphrase it, right? Just a little bit of this amazing text that reminds us of the way God wants us to be in the world. Is this, is this not the fast I choose for you? To loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free, to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your people, then your light will shine forth like the dawn and your healing spring up quickly. Your vindicator will go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you'll call and the Lord will answer. If you cry for help, God will say, here I am. And God will change our names. And we'll be called repairers of the breach. And restorers of the streets to live in. Notice this text has everything to do with economic justice. Yes. Feed the poor. Clothe the naked. In other words, God is a little bit disinterested in our feasts and festivals and bells and homilies and gospel choirs and harps and, you know, secret handshakes All right. <laughs> that make us part of a worshiping community. But God is totally interested in the outward expression of love, revolutionary love to everybody to make sure that everyone has enough. So at Middle Church, we take that really seriously. I've been here 14 years. I cannot hardly believe that. But we've made four different vision statements in that time frame, different strategic plans, um, working particularly in the granular way every year to make sure that we believe the work we're doing is inside the V, inside the vision that is cast in scripture, in those scriptures. Not scriptures that talk about abominations and crazy things like that but scriptures that are anchored in love and Jesus' call to love and God's call to love. So I'm going to read our vision statement to you. It's somewhere in your book, but listen to what we think God is calling us to do. Middle Church is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, intergenerational movement of spirit and justice, powered by revolutionary love with room for all, following in the way of Jesus' radical love and inspired by the prophets, Middle Church is called by God to do a bold new thing on the earth. We aim to heal the soul and the world by dismantling racist, classist, sexist, and homophobic systems of oppression. Because our God is still speaking in many languages, we work in inter-religious partnerships to uproot injustice, eradicate poverty, care for the brokenhearted, and build the reign of God on earth. This activism is fueled by our faith. Our faith is expressed in art. Our art is an act of prayer connecting us with the Holy Spirit. 
founded prior to this nation, 1628, y'all. We're the oldest church in North America and we're the oldest corporation in the nation. Founded in 1628, Middle Church affirms the transformative power of moral imagination, reclaiming and reframing Christianity inside our walls, on the street, and in virtual spaces around the globe. Not just here, but around, around the globe. Around the globe, virtual spaces. Give us some theology, Mama Ruby. What you got over there? Wow. <laughs> How do I follow that, y'all? <laughs> What an honor always to be in this space with Jackie Lewis, my daughter, my sister, my colleague, whose voice has inspired many of us and called us out of our zones of complacency and reaffirmed our power and our agency to make new things and new worlds come into being. Mm. Thank you, Jackie. Amen. Thank you, Ruby. I have a column on Facebook, how many of you know, called From My Front Porch. My front porch. And I observed, and I, when I grew up in the South, the front porch was a subversive space where black women, older black women sat on the front porch and they were the guardians of the children, and they made sure that outsiders did not come into the community and harm anyone. And moreover, it was a place where you could talk about anything you wanted to talk about, except you had to do it with great deal of respect. And if you violated that ethic, then you were not welcome for a while. So I grew up under the tutelage of those black women, spiritual geniuses who did front porch duty. And at the end of the day, we would, we would play outside, and at the end of the day, the women on the porch would begin a drum beat, and they would call our names because it was time to come out of the world playing and go home to get ready for the next day. So they would say, Ruby Nell, Ruby Nell, your mama's calling you, girl. If you ignored it, the whole community would then tell you, don't you hear your mama calling you? <laughs> it's time for you to go home. And so we've been out in the world, and there's a voice echoing in all of us this morning, calling our names. It is time to come home to our authentic selves, and be about the business of a new world coming. Mm -hmm. Amen. I thought about our task within the context of revolutionary love, and I wrote a little thing about what I think. We're called to be spiritual provocateurs, word wizards, and expert seamstress, seamstress able to turn a piece of hand-down, rotting material and ragged cloth of hatred into beautiful and useful, as well as harmonious colors, color-coordinated and well-armed garments. We are called to be spiritual provocateurs, to shake up the status quo, to be, but not to be devious provocateurs, not manipulative provocateurs, but to be transparent provocateurs. As I sat on my front porch this morning, thinking about what to talk about, my grandmother's voice came to me. When I was a child, my grandmother used to say, Ruby Nell, you see that wall over there? I said, yes, ma'am. She says, that's not a wall. That's just another space to walk through. And all of my life, my people have been geniuses at walking through spaces that people told us were walls. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I, I want to say to you this morning is that sometimes as progressive communities and radical communities, we have this desire for safe spaces. We always want to have these spaces where we're not nothing rumbles on the inside, that we don't feel 
the weight of someone's word that, feel, that feels indicting, that feels like the words are indicting us. But I want to tell you that that's very dangerous because the empire keeps us in a womb-like stage. Yeah. Do not want us to go and be born in the light of day. And this sense of wanting cozy spaces is really an empire impulse. And sometimes my grandmother would tell me, you have to go in dangerous places to get what you need. Sometimes you have to go in dangerous places or places that feel dangerous to get what you need. So our work is subversive. It's not warm and cozy work and neither is coalition building warm and cozy work. It requires each of us to make an adjustment and interrogate the text in our own heads to interrogate our assumptions about ourselves, each other, God, and every aspect of human creation. I also heard the voices of my ancestors held in captivity, their bodies commodified, dehumanized, their personhood and their spirits vilified, black women victims of state-sanctioned rape, black girls victims of state-sanctioned rape, economic exploitation to feed the predatory and greedy machinery of an enslavement industrial complex to, pro to provide for the well-being of a people who fed off of the body and lives of people, of, of black people. And I heard my, 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 and out of that brutal situation where sometimes my people fell so low down in the valley, they couldn't hear nobody pray. But yet out of that arid soil, they fertilized a new theology in this troubled land, and that theology was black folk theology. And at the heart of that theology was agape. I love everybody, I love everybody, I love everybody in my heart, and you can't make me hate you, and you can't make me hate you in my heart. That was revolutionary love. It was an alternative to the systemic hatred that fueled the machinery of an enslavement industrial complex. It was a way it provided a path of redemption, not only for black people, but even for people who enslaved them out of the hell of moral nihilism onto a pathway of redemption. That to me is the first plank from my people of revolutionary love in this land called America. Beautiful, Ruby. And this morning I just want to end this by saying I also heard the psalmist, they understood that while they wanted a clean heart, it didn't happen by simply praying. It didn't happen by sitting across the room in, the, in, in their shacks talking about it, that you had to blend the, the inner life with the outside praxis, that it was a spiritual call, that it was a call to agency. And the psalmist says, God, give me a clean heart and renew my spirit. That is a call to action. That's not sitting down intellectualizing. That's interrogating one's own self. It's a process of purging out of us empire consciousness and moving towards a mountaintop consciousness where we begin to see ourselves and each other in very different and clearer ways. So it is a call to a higher consciousness. All movements 
are calls to a higher consciousness. It's not about a job, it's a consciousness movement. And finally, I heard this morning the cries of black and brown immigrants echoing throughout the land, saying, by the waters of Babylon, where we sat down and where we wept, when we remembered Zion, and how can we sing our sacred songs in a strange and bitter land? Mm -hmm. And I heard their voices this morning saying, how can we maintain the sacredness of our body and our lives in this reign of terror, in the midst of ethnic cleansing, in the midst of an immigration industrial complex that continues the unbroken thread that was threads that were found in the enslavement industrial complex, commodification, captivity, dispersion, dehumanization, degradation, vilification, exploitation, and state-sanctioned rape. No matter what system of economic, no matter these traits, fuel are the heartbeats of an American economy that has, been re that has remained unbroken for the last 400 years. Whether you're talking about the prison industrial complex, whether you're talking about the convict lease system, leasing system that happened after black, during Black Reconstruction that gave us the chain game where you're talking about the migratory system, where you're talking about plantation systems that grew up in the South. And in each of these economies, I will end by saying that people of color have been shoved with force into sites of terror, whether you call them plantations, whether you call them detention centers, or whether you call them migratory camps. That's a way of sanitizing the reality, but they are sites of terror. And today, as we sit at this conference, I executed raids around this country yesterday and the day before, and ended up putting 97 brown children in Colorado in an ice packing plant, separate from their families by the waters of Babylon, where we sat and wept when we remember Zion, where the wicked carried us away captivity and required of us a song. How can we speak our lives and proclaim the sacredness of our body and lives in this reign of white supremacist terror? that feeds an immigration industrial complex and an economy that is predatory and death-driven. Mm -hmm. Ruby, the, the, the poverty in which my mom and dad lived is hard for me to describe. My mom, was picking cotton in the Mississippi Delta when she was four years old. And by the time she was 11, the, the bragging on her was she could pick as much cotton as a grown man yep. and carry the bag. Uh, um, uh, the oldest girl in a family of three children, my uncle, her brother, being frankly obese and not able to work. Mom was her mother's husband type person, partner person, and the big sister um, to her little sister, Verlene. And she, frankly, didn't graduate high school until she was 21 years old. A fact I learned only recently after she passed because she worked and worked and worked and therefore took longer to graduate from high school. They used to use corn cobs sometimes for, for TP because they didn't have any money to buy it. She and my auntie played basketball 
and their mom would work three jobs to scrape up money to send them off to play basketball. But she had like two pair of underwear, mm -hmm. and she'd have to wash one and hang it and wash the one and hang it. And I'll make you laugh, when I was a young woman, I had some underwear, but because mommy was always washing, you know, like that just came in my generation, is the right. way you travel. <laughs> I can have 10 pair of drawers in my suitcase, but I'm still washing and hanging. Right. Like that's just the way you do it. Right. <laughs> wash and hang, wash and hang. Right. And make sure they're always clean. Make sure they're clean. always clean. That's right. Just freak, no matter, no matter how poor you are, they better be clean. <laughs> my dad uh, grew up with a stepfather and, a, and his mom. And stepfather hated dad, so he was abused by him. Um, his mother inherited land when the stepfather died, and the camp clan came often to shoot at her to try to take the land back from them. He cries every Christmas because when we give him presents, if he gets something more than the one sweater he got from the time he was seven till he left home at 17 to go to the Air Force, it makes him cry that we love him enough to give him more than the one turtleneck often hand-me-down sweater he'd get. It's hard to describe their, the poverty. Um, and, but I want to say, you know, we've been talking about uh, dreams and we've been, we're talking about complete the dream. I just read you the Middle Church vision. Of course I have my own dreams, <coughs> my own visions. You want some water? I do. I'm going to drink some. Okay. And I just don't think anybody should be poor. period. To me, it's very simple. And I feel like it's my job to convert you <laughs> if you're not converted. I mean, the scripture says the poor you'll always have with you. And like, I don't know what the heck Jesus meant when he said that. Maybe he was indicting us. Maybe he was describing the human condition that we wouldn't realize how many resources we have, that we wouldn't be ambitious enough to say, you know what? In a nation this wealthy, everybody ought to have enough. Not the economy model needs some poor people. Not small businesses need to pay a less than a living wage so they can stay in business, but like a radical revolution of values, to quote my friend William Barber, to understand that every human being just deserves the dignity of food on the table. Every, every human being deserves the dignity of a warm place to sleep and clean water coming out of their faucets and the dignity of work that every child, every single child on the globe ought to be able to find food without climbing over garbage heaps or without panhandling or selling their bodies to make money. Like to me, this is the basic human right, is the ability to sustain your life. And if white people are poor, black people are poorer. And that's the fact. If, Latino, if white people are poor, Latino people are poorer. And that's the fact. And I know people will tell you, but what about Appalachia? And I say, that's in the statistics already. Thank you very much. And let me just share with you. I hate reading stats, so I'm going to go really fast and invite you to go to um, urban.org or pew.org and find these really horrifying facts. I'm not as going to be as creative as Sister Simone was this morning. But now I'm talking about wealth. Like, and wealth is what you own minus what you owe, right? So just things, I'm not making it up, but as we interrogate the text of our lives, you know, as a preacher person, one text I'm interrogating is scripture. I gave you that, right? The other text I'm interrogating is the text of my congregation. What are we dreaming about? What are we thinking about? But we have to interrogate the text of the nation, of the world. So, although average wealth has increased over the past 50 years, and it has. It has not increased equally. Families near the bottom of the wealth distribution, those at the 10th percentile, went from having no wealth, none, that was zero base, 
to being $1,000 in debt. Those in the middle, the sort of 20th to 90th percentile, their wealth doubled between 1963 and 2016. Good for us. I'm in that space. Me and my little black siblings, whose mommy and daddy didn't have any money. Families near the top, the ones at the 90th percentile, their wealth, again, what you own, what you're worth minus what you owe, increased fivefold. Wow. And those at the top 99th percentile, the ones who are the 1%, the wealth of their families increased sevenfold. Now that's just across America. Let's stick some race in it. Because income inequality worsens wealth inequality. Because the income people have available is what they invest, it's what they buy a house with, right? It's what multiplies, it's what they can leave for their children. Here's the race story. In 1963, the average wealth of white families was $121,000 higher than the average wealth of non-white families, 121,000. By 2016, the average wealth of white families was $919,000, almost a million dollars, right? $700,000 more than the average wealth of black families. And that wealth was 140,000 and Hispanic families 192. To break it down even further, white family wealth is seven times greater than black family wealth. Wow. And five times greater than Hispanic family wealth. Very rarely do we find statistics about Asians, but I know they're at Pew, and I'm not going to look for that right now, because statistics might make you go to sleep, or might make your it's mind right. open, or your head spin. Why is that? Because black families started in chattel slavery, largely in this nation. People didn't get 40 acres and a mule when slavery ended. When Emancipation Proclamation was broadcast across the land and finally got to those folks on Juneteenth, immediately there is an historic and horrific reaction to the liberation of the slaves, and slavery continues. Yes. In the form of sharecropping. My grandmama was a sharecropper. You don't own anything, and anything you make goes back to the man. Reconstruction meant lynching and the taking of land and the reinstitution of slavery in this way. Fast forward to world wars, where blacks, though segregated, fought for our nation and came back home to ridiculous prejudice, and the inability to take advantage of things like veterans' rights that helped veterans buy their first home. So they didn't buy any homes. So then they don't have that house, to, uh, to their starter house, to the next house, to leave to their kid, to go to the next thing. And when you could get a loan to buy a house, you were redlined out of neighborhoods where housing values rose. So you are retarded, you are diminished, you are behind the curve of, of economic development as an African-American person. That is the deep, that is the manifestation of a deeper issue. Poverty has a spiritual context. Yes. Poverty is not abstract. It has social and spiritual meaning. And poverty in the West is deeply rooted in spiritual malformation 
and the social pathology of whiteness that gives rise to white supremacy and a white supremacist economic system as well as white soul murder mm -hmm. that detaches one. Let me understand, I didn't say that white people had no souls. I said that whiteness requires white people to commit soul murder, to detach themselves from the realities and the pain of other people. It is I-centered, and the great, great tragedy is that the soul murder required to be white requires white people to kill their ethnicities, to separate themselves from their history, to dismember themselves, and to not forget if they were Irish when their grandparents were strangers at the gate of England standing outside or if you were English, remember forgetting the days when, when the upper classes used your body and used your lives as commodification, vilification, and dehumanization. It requires you to kill that and become someone reconstructed in the images of the very people who were the source of your pain. Amen. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. The very people and then, not only that, it creates an artificial identity that says that the very essence of who we are is what we own. It is the materialization of power and the commodification, commodification of spirituality. Are you with me? Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. And so that we find ourselves participa participants, because each of us participate, in some aspects of soul murder, where for the opiates and the trinkets of seduction that we think make us who we are, we participate every day in killing our humanity while sitting back allowing other people's humanities to be murdered also. Amen. So what do we do? How do we come out of this? We come out of this by understanding that the deep hunger that we feel in our souls is not a material hunger. Because we have things, there's power there. There's so many consumer things in this society that some of us have become rack packs. Whatever you call people who Pat rats. Pat rats. <laughs> you know, and, and we just can't get enough. And, the, and guess what? We will never get enough because it's not, a, it's not a material hunger. It's a spiritual hunger at the very heart of the West. Amen, Ruby. It is a spiritual hunger. Amen. Amen. And so I want to just say to you this morning that each of us, must understand this call to revolutionary love, first of all, begins with ourselves so that we don't hate ourselves enough that we kill ourselves to become, to become just like the people who are the parent of our pain. That we reclaim our souls. And the question is how do we do that in every, every community who has stood outside of the gates of the empire have developed what I call folk cultural resources that sustain them, enable them to get up and keep on moving, enable them to hope and dream and, and bring into being manifestations of that dream and more fundamentally to till generations for the day that the dream would come into being when there was no evidence that it would ever happen. Mm -hmm. But they kept on tilling. And, and so we have to really go back to our ethnicities and claim our culture and spiritual resources because white is not a culture. Whiteness is not a culture. You're depleted of a culture. 
Empireism is not a culture. The only culture that it is is one that we should not want to claim. It's over and against greedy, predatory, non-redemptive. And yes, you want me to be quiet? No, I don't. I want to get in whenever you're done. I, I just want to say, <laughs> I just want to say one last don't thing. Don't be quiet. I, I really think that because we tend to step away from poverty as if it's something that when we do this work, we have to speak in tongues. We have to speak in tongues because what the West tells us is that the ultimate expression of reality is a material one. And that kills, the, that kills soul and consciousness and history. And so what we have to do is to say that one can be materially poor and one can be materially rich, but their souls can be impoverished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the white West suffers from an impoverished soul. And each time we sign on to, to, to whiteness, we bleach our souls of our humanity. Beautiful. And so I also want us to understand that when you call people of color in absolute terms like marginalized, you have bought into an empire definition of who we are because we have less money. We might be marginalized in, in white material Western world, but with each other, we are significant others. Amen. So we've got... Having said that, Jackie, you wake up every, every time I hear you, you talk about us being in a hot mess. Yes. What do you think is this hot mess and how the hell do we get out of it? Woo! That's a good tee up, my sister. I, I mean, just a couple more sentences of analysis that includes hot mess and then maybe a call to action. I think we have bought into the BS of how different we are. That, that's the hottest part of the hot mess. That's the hottest part. I wish you'd clap for that. The, the, the fact, what, what keeps us, what keeps us chasing whiteness, people of color chase whiteness. Absolutely. What keeps us chasing whiteness is the way whiteness has separated us, the way whiteness is woven into Christianity, the way whiteness is woven into the so-called American dream. Whiteness is the, is the goal, the aim, when I'm white enough, and by the way, Dave Chappelle says, you're not white unless you're a billionaire. So, white people, unless you're a billionaire, you're not white either. <laughs> but if whiteness has become the aim or the goal, it separates, our self, it separates us from our true self, but it also separates us from one another because it isn't real. It's, it's, it's a false construct. Absolutely. So we are annihilated in that whiteness. Each of us loses our particularity. I read an article one time says white means never having to say you're ethnic. So we lost Lithuanian, we lost German, we lost Italian. With it to echo Ruby, we lost I'm going to bring you some cabbage and corned beef when you're, when you're sick. I'm going to bring you a pot of greens when you're tired. We lost the, the interconnectedness of our humanity pretending to be different. So we need to disrupt that And sense. what is that difference? The, dif what? the difference, the, what is the difference? Who, I mean, what are we pretending to be? We're pretending Say to that be, again. You're, you're pretending, we're pretending to be raced. We, we bought into race as a real category. There are some black people. There are some black people and they're lazy and they're on welfare. There are some Latino people and they live in loud houses and wear loud colors. There are some Asian people and they assimilate well and play violins and make good money. And there are some white people who are chosen. That, that I think has separated ourselves, us from our true self. Our true identity is human. That's our true identity. And, and I think if we can do human, and like I would say our true identity is child of God, maybe it's child of universe, but our, but our true identity is human and siblings. Can we, can we have a particular history and still be human and not use our particularities to, to eviscerate someone else? We have to. Can we have history as well as universality? We have to have particular history. We love means, we're talking about revolutionary love. Diogenes Allen says love is the unconditional regard for the unique 
particularity of the other. Yes. Two, I'll say, beautiful black women with dreadlocks. We have our... <laughs> but we... But we are particular, right? Raised by particular families, raised with particular stories. Our culture, though shared, is also unique. So to take Ruby's point, we don't squint our eyes and not see the differences in each other. We don't let the difference be one is less human than the other. And that's what's built into the American yes. contract. And just to be really clear, you're sitting in a Dutch reformed church. With a black woman. I'm so embarrassed to say that out loud, but it's true. And in this Dutch reformed church built on the land of the Lenape, who called this nation Turtle Island, and my, not my people, but the people who built the church, they weren't my people, but the people who built this church in 1628, who came to trap furs with the Native American people, didn't come for religious freedom, built a church nonetheless at the fort, at the wall at the fort, which became Wall Street. And the Lenape people said, you know what? Why don't y'all just chill here for a little while? I'm paraphrasing. And we'll see you when we come back. And they came back to stolen land. So let's not let our economic discussion not include the way America is built on stolen land by black, by enslaved African people. And then with cheap Chinese labor. So all of that is in the stew. Just a couple more points. I want us to think about reparations yes. on our tongue. Yes. I'm just going to say it. I said it at a Jewish synagogue and they never invited me back. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Dr. Lewis, would you say a word about reparations? Yes, I will. Never hear from you again. And what I mean by that is this. And this is the place I want to analysis convert you. You get to be a person whose parents had wealth and you get to have it. Good for you. <clears throat> but if you're a human being that's a sibling, will you let your sibling human family die of hunger while you have your wealth? So it just makes me, and I know, I got wealthy people in my community who do this work beautifully with me, partner with me to do this work. And if they didn't have the wealth that they have, I can't do as much work as I do. So I'm giving snaps for wealth. I'm talking about sharing our wealth. I'm talking about reparations in this way. When we send ourselves to Puerto Rico, to me that's reparations. When we think about what should we be doing with the reservations and stop lying to ourselves because they can have a casino, that somehow they're okay, when we think about mentoring Native American young children, when we think about partnering with Native American communities, that's reparations. When we mentor African American students, when we adopt a kindergarten, when we make donations to the United Negro College Fund, when we sponsor Tuskegee, when we understand Hope Zones, when we partner with Freedom Schools, that's reparations. When we think about Latino, Latina people as our people, and we work with them, and we learn from them, that's reparations. And I'm saying we're not faithful, we're not human, we're not siblings, if we're not thinking about how to balance the economic scales. Let me just, let me push back on that. Let me put something, let me push back on that. While I recognize that white people in the driver's seat economically I want to say that they're standing at the curb spiritually. And so that if we talk in double tongues, how might, when what might reparations look that transcends <coughs> this material world of, of riches? That's good. And I want to say to you, let me lay out to you what I think reparations look like. It is a pathway towards redemption that each of us can walk if we choose. And let me begin, it's a pathway of five R's. The first R is recapitulation. Telling the truth about our histories with each other. Mm -hmm. Telling the truth about not only our histories with God, I mean with each other, but our histories with God and our history with the universe. And the third thing is reparation. 
And what that means is not just giving us things, because that forever puts white people in the driver's seat. And what do they have to do except give? There's no work for them to do. And so that the next reparation means repairing the harm, the spiritual and social harm that we've done to each other and that, and that whiteness has, has made us do to each other. The other, then you move towards reconciliation. And reconciliation is like mediation. Both people have to have a voice in the process. Everybody, in order to reconcile, I can't dictate the terms. And if I'm just talking about what white people owe me, then I don't give white people a chance to go back and repair the harm that the parents of their pain have created in them and that they also go to the empire and renegotiate their humanities. And the next one is restoration. Re reconciliation allows us to begin the process of restoring each other back into the universality and the particularities of our lives into a beloved community that harmonizes the I with the we and the we with the I. So I'm gonna push back on your pushback. Okay, sure, great. I really appreciate it. Great. Because I don't, because one, I got two things to push back on your pushback, and I'm really teasing calling it a pushback. I wanna add. No, 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 let's push back a little bit. I think that there are black wealthy people who need to get in the reparations business. I didn't say that, I didn't, but I black people are not systemically, right. are not, we're talking about, we're not talking about individual people. Right. We're talking about systemic and social diseases. And I'm talking about systemically where African American people who are wealthy also need to get in the project you just described. And I want, don't want anyone white let off the hook. This is my pushback. Because somebody said thank you, and I don't know who said it, when Ruby says, oh, and then white people just feel like they have to give money. And somebody's like, thank you, and I'm like, I don't think she's trying to let anybody off the hook. That's my pushback. But Be no, let me finish. I, I'm not, let me finish. Let me finish. You, how let me finish, you hear Mama. That? Let me finish. <laughs> I'm really saying, as strongly as I can, no matter what race or ethnicity we claim, because we said whiteness is a construct, I'm asking us to think about how we use our money. Period. Be because, almost done. Okay. Because, <laughs> because, I'm sorry, hungry children are driven to desperate acts. And hungry children are, are not necessarily going to be able to be in conversations about reconciliation when they're hungry. So we have to do everything, Mama Ruby said. But, and however, we until them. we have a transformation of values, as you pointed out earlier, until we change our consciousness and how we see each other and our place in the world with God and each other, we will keep recreating the same empire structures and just creating new elites. Until we really begin to change the very heart and that if we build a beloved community, the thing about a new consciousness is that it creates a new world. And, we, it, wait, let me finish. And, let me, let me. <laughs> and, go and, ahead, go ahead. and, no, yes, go ahead, go yes. Ahead. And that's what this conference is about, is transforming form, form your hearts. That's what this conversation is about, is changing your hearts. So you are the heart changing ones, aren't you? You are the ones going out to change the hearts. And I just don't want us to get stuck in what Ruby said versus what Jackie said. That's what I'm pushing back on. This has got to be a multifaceted project. Some of us need to have our hearts changed. Some of us already have had our hearts changed and are wondering how to operationalize that. But I don't think that Some of us, any of our hearts are wholly changed, that changing hearts is a dynamic process that continues okay. throughout our lives. Okay, can you just let me make this point? No, I can't. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I want to make this, I'm going to Go make ahead. this, I'm going to make this point so nobody misunderstands us. Tell them that because black women do this I'm going to, we do this all the time. This is front porch talk with, 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 with sweet, with uh, peach cobbler. Right. And ice cream. Right. And iced tea or red wine. This is what we do. We're like, we're like the secret Jews. The Jews like to argue. So do we. Right. But I, but I really want to be, I'm trying to make a fine point I that you. I don't want you to not hear me say. 
We can't leave the room thinking that we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. And Ruby's not saying that. But somebody's writing down because someone's uncomfortable. Somebody online is uncomfortable with what I said. And so they're trying to find the out. And the out is we're not ready yet. Transformation, restoration is a dynamic process. There's steps. That's not what she said. But it can feel like, well, step one, step two, step three, step four. I'm saying when you go home, step one. Do not vote for anybody that isn't putting the economy on the table. You have to do that. Step one, read yourself, preachers. Look in the, find Ruby's porch thing. This is going to be live streamed. You can have it later. Look at the six points. But start someplace with the practical that when people are hungry and we don't address it, we have failed our humanity. Charity has existed for 400 years and our humanity is still failed. What I really believe is that revolutionary love begins in the heart and moves outward. I believe that revolutionary love, as the psalmist said, starts with the process of not only what we can do for others, but what we also must do for ourselves. I believe that revolutionary love is not only putting food on someone's table, but it's also not killing someone in the streets of America. I believe that revolutionary love predicates itself on the efficacy and the sanctity of all human body and lives. I believe that revolutionary love is the thing in each of us that the empire fears and goes about its business for generations and generations to kill. So my thing for you is find that revolution, and revolutionary love is to be able to see the possibility and the goodness in people, even when they can't see it in themselves. That is revolutionary love. It means that we go out in the world from this place, from this time, understanding that despite our best desires, that this is not work for easy grace. It's not work that we do for anybody else and not do for ourselves. It is work for our own redemption. And finally, I want to just say about revolutionary love is that it is not punitive. It is not, movement building is not punitive. It is redemptive. And in the work that we do, as we think about how might we manifest that revolutionary love, it is not a love that we want to bring down somebody for what they did 50 years ago when they didn't have the consciousness that they have today. Revolutionary love provides an opportunity for each of us to become something today that we were not yesterday. It's a dynamic process. Revolutionary love is the, the process of building a beloved community in the midst of fragmentation, dehumanization, degradation, isolation, vilification. And finally, I want to just say that the Ford Foundation released a report that said by the year 2050, and this sort of underscores what Jackie says, by the year 2050, black medium income will be zero. By the year 2053, black medium in The first time I heard that, I got pissed off. It's like, wait, what are they saying? My medium in And then I realized I won't even be alive. And so, <laughs> and so I realized that there was a horror story beneath that that got caught up in my own ego about not wanting to have zero medium wealth, right? That, 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 they, they, that this country has issued a death warrant yes. on young black children today and those yet to be born. They do not intend to have a future for them to have a future in this country because in a white supremacist, in a, in a world that is predominantly growing, predominantly majority colored, 
in a world where the fertility rate of, of people of color outnumber the fertility rates of white societies, these guardians, these cultural warriors who are guardians of a white supremacist global world do not intend for my children and their children to have a future because they see the future, their futures as a challenge to the efficacy of white hegemony and white pop nationalist power. I say to you, revolutionary love begins right now in our hearts to be horrified, to see the, to feel the plight of young black children today and those yet to be born. That to me is revolutionary love. And we need to stop there. <laughs>